Well, hello, everyone. I am that Williams guy here for another episode. And this format tonight is going to be a little different because I will be abandoning you shortly and leaving you in the, I hope, trustworthy hands of John Hearn, who will serve as your guest host tonight. And after I bail out, John will introduce the panel and tell you what the topic's going to be. But I'll fill you in on what's been going on the last couple of weeks and why John is, is taking over tonight. Uh, we haven't had a show in two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was just swamped with work. As you know, if you're a regular listener or viewer of the show, I'm back in graduate school because the first time wasn't enough. Let's do this the second time in my 50s. Um, I was just swamped with graduate work two weeks ago, and I could not get it done in time and set up an re- episode and get it recorded. Last week, I caught some sort of crud, and I am not over it yet. It's been well over a week that I've had it. And as we were all logging in on the video side, Tim, who is a doctor, was very nice to say, well, you looked whipped. And so we have a professional opinion that I am whipped. And it's been, it's been a rough week with that. So I'm working full-time, teaching two college classes, taking a graduate-level class, and, hey, let's do shows. Well, you know, we need one more thing to do. So with that, I'm going to bail out and hopefully not turn everything off as I leave. We did a test run for our hand, but John's going to take over. Oh, but before we do that, the podcast feed, as of just before we turned on everything tonight, was at 99,234 downloads in place. So maybe this episode will be the one that puts it over 100,000. And if that happens, we're going to give all the credit to John Holshin. Not John Hurd. John Holshin. <laughs> because we never give any credit to John Hearn. Oh, no. No, 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 no. no. And uh, with that, uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. I'll finally get to listen to an episode and go, wow, that was a good show. Yeah. And uh, without having heard it as it was all played. So with that, See you later, everybody. Thanks, Lee. Excellent. All right. Uh, John Hearn here. I think if you've been paying attention to the podcast at all, you know who I am. So we'll skip the uh, introductions real quick. Uh, The topic tonight came up kind of uh, spontaneously. I was speaking with Mr. Holshin earlier this week. I said, we really need to talk about the NPI, especially from an end user's perspective as far as that goes. So uh, I literally got off the phone with John and I'm like, you know, message uh, Lee, message Tim, and I'm like, hey, let's just do a show, and it came together. So uh, real quickly before I introduce the rest of the guests here, the NTI was a competition slash training event that spanned 20 years from about 1991 to 2010. Um, It got a lot of attention in the gun magazines because back in the day, that's how we got all of our information as far as that goes. And it was a springboard into the serious tactical world, for a, a lack of better words. Uh, certain people like Andy Stanford, um, John Holshin, Greg, uh, uh, John's partner, Greg, uh, were, were kind of able to claim their fame in the fact that they had they had you know been recognized at the NTI. So let's talk about what the NTI is, what we got from it, all that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to start out uh, and I mentioned John Holshin. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself real quick and how many years uh, you were at the NTI. All right. I had a career in the military. I was in uh, military intelligence and then special operations, wore the funny green green beanie on my head, green beret, for about half of my career. Uh, a lot of that, though, was crossover with intelligence-related stuff. And uh, I had the uh, strange timing to retire from the military, uh, retire from government service kind of the first time just before 9-11. And uh, a couple of years later, I uh, found my way back into doing government work um, in uh, the contracting world and in other, other aspects. So spent uh, the next uh, 10 years or so in and out of the Middle East, like a lot of other folks doing, uh, doing things like that. I've uh, been a trainer for a long time. Uh, that is the core of Special Forces. Uh, historically, has been training. Uh, so I kind of came to it naturally. Uh, I, I felt like, well... 
a lot of what I did had to do with uh, ones and twos and threes and four person elements. Uh, it wasn't uh, team tactics at the time for uh, a lot of what I was doing and teaching a, a program that some folks called one of the original loan operator courses. So it was a, a real natural move from there to developing these skills you know, as a dad and a husband and a private citizen, home in between deployments, and then teaching that material to other folks. Uh, along the way, relevant to what we're talking about tonight, I participated in the NTI, I believe nine times. I kind of lost track in there, trying to go back and figure out the years. And then uh, the last, uh, I think it was 2008 and 2009, uh, I helped, uh, I got invited to help put it on. So I didn't actually shoot in it, but uh, I ran stages. I ran live fire stages, and I also uh, ran uh, force on force stage. Uh, both of those years also, now that I think about it. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Tell us a little bit about yourself, since you have, I think, yet to make an appearance on this fabulous venue. To whom? Was that addressed to me, John? It is. You are Dr. Burke, are you not? Yes, I am. I You, you cut out just when you said who you were speaking to. <laughs> Um, I'm actually a student and not a trainer, but I've been a serious student since the mid nineties. And in fact, was a student of John's, uh, in 96, shortly after he went to the NTI, uh, for the first time, um, uh, and won it the first time he went, uh, and that kind of piqued my interest about what it was. So I started going to it. I think uh, from 98 to 2010, I probably went six or seven times. I uh, wasn't able to go every year because of work obligations. Um, and I suspect my experience is, is a little bit different from John's because I started going to the NTI relatively early in, in my training. And uh, so it was very different for me than, than, someone who'd been doing it for years and years and basically walked in having already mastered all the skills that he, he needed to do well there. Um, so I, I, I found that part of it very interesting. Uh, in, in the real world, I'm an anesthesiologist, um, but I, I shoot uh, recreationally, I shoot competitively, and I train probably four or five classes a year. Excellent. And one thing I'll say about Tim is that most of the times when students are introducing themselves and they say they're a doctor, as an instructor, you kind of go, oh, man, I would actually say that Tim Burke is one of the few doctors who can actually listen to instruction, which makes him a true exception and a bit of an anomaly. <laughs> so, uh, Randy? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Randy Harris. Uh, uh, the NTI that I went to was in 2007 uh, with you and Tom and couple of other range master guys um as far as historically uh started my um i guess my training journey really started when i was like 11 12 year old kid starting to read all the gun magazines and you know as i got older and started shooting started shooting competitively i got uh brought into teaching the uh tennessee handgun carry permit class uh with a friend who needed some help doing that uh did that for a few years um when Gabe Suarez started his uh, instructor program, uh, I got into that and taught for them for about 15 years and have been running Harris Combative Strategies for about the last five years or so. Um, I don't know. I guess that's pretty much it. And uh, um, just as historically, like I said, I think most of us, uh, at least Randy and I, got into the NTI later. I believe the first edition was in 1991. Uh, I attended, I think it was 05, 06, and 07. And my understanding is that the event morphed a little bit from when it was initially founded. Uh, most of the time it was offered in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. For a few years, they ran out to gun site. Uh, but my understanding was they pretty much quickly returned to Harrisburg, and that's where the, the last running of it was. Um, it was an absolutely interesting experience. Um, for those that have never been, it would start out with an opening lecture by Skip Gokenhauer. And, you know, part of the problem with the NTI was you had to learn how the game was played, I guess. 
And when I quickly realized that the only point of the opening lecture by Skip was to get you as stressed as possible, and he did a really, really good job of that. There was always a bit of a theme. Uh, I remember one of the years was uh, post-Katrina, and the premise was you were going into a uh, storm-ravaged area to try to rescue a loved one, as far as that goes. So there was always a unifying theme. Uh, what made the NTI unique, and we'll start to let the guys chime in anytime they want to, is it was not just a simple shooting match. Um, the, NTI, uh, the NTI, as I understand it, was formed by three individuals, Skip Gogenhauer, Walt Roush, and a third individual whose name is escaping me. Uh, Chuck Davis. Walt Roush. I'm sorry? It's Chuck Davis. And Chuck Davis as well. Uh, Walt Roush had a lot of real-world law enforcement experience that he brought to the event, as far as that goes. Um, the way it worked is that there were a series of live fire stages, uh, and there was also a village that was a strict force-on-force -force exercise. Um, it was a combination of all those events. Uh, you were evaluated as you went through everyone. In the later years, uh, there were video recordings of your runs. I'll try to post some of those up to the Facebook group. Um, but in a nutshell, it took you two or three, I think it was two days, to go through the various scenarios. And you they were around a consistent theme. You would go into the village. And you would have a series of simple tasks and client might be go to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription. And along the way, things would happen uh, or potentially happen and you had to deal with them. Uh, how does that sound so far, guys? Any comments there? Well, I, I think something that's really important to uh, to frame this because there's nothing else like it. So I, I think people uh, jump into a completely wrong frame. And that is that the folks that put the NTI on, it it was never intended to be a competition. It, it was not designed to compare one participant to another participant and rank them relative to other participants. It was designed as a venue that had two, two main functions. And one was to allow individuals to test themselves against a relatively unprecise standard in that the only standard was Treat this like it's real and let's see how your skill set, your equipment choices, everything about how you have prepared stands up to one group of people's concept of what relevant testing is. So that was the, the, the primary from the participants point of view. Frankly, from the other side of it, from the team, it was really to for them to look at the state of the art of training and figure out how to guide their training based on what they saw and other people's participation. So the idea when we say it's a competition, you know, that then gets people in the mindset that, well, I need to know the rules. I need to know how it's scored so that I can maximize perform my performance within the rule system and the, and the scoring system. And it was never designed to, to do that. As a participant, you didn't know what the scoring system was. There was this clipboard that this person behind you would be frantically scribbling on, and you never knew quite what you were being evaluated on. It was a, uh, you know, one of the things that makes the NTI unique is the word subjective. I think that uh, rather than, uh, I, I think in a lot of shooting competitions these days, we try to make everything so utterly objective and everything utterly fair, and that's not how the real world works. Um, and, you know, part of adopting the NTI was adopting their worldview and, um, you know, they're uh, being willing to comply with their subjectivity as far as how everything was going uh, in, in your performance as far as that goes. Yeah, I would also add that the way they did that um, is useful to look at. There were two completely different arenas. One arena, arena was interactive, what we would now call force on force, although they make a big point again that there are a lot of interactions that force wasn't part of the, the equation at all, but it was just purely interactive. And that was that tested your ability to interact with people and to manage environments. Um, yes, you had a sim gun and you might end up using it. Then there were the live fire stages and the live fire stages were designed to test your gun skills as well as your management of environment skills, your ability to read the environment, your ability to move within the environment, maximize all of the tactical aspects of the environment while getting hits on target. And really that was real simple when people want to argue about scoring. Part of that gets into the targets. Most of them were you shot them until they went down. So you, we didn't need to argue about hit zones. When it went down, it went down. Um, and it was pretty simple. It was get 
accomplish that objective, get the target down as quickly as you can without unnecessary exposure of yourself to that threat or other threats. And that that really summarizes the what the rules are, which, you know, that's a lot like the way I approach preparation for the real world. I, you know, other people can speak to that, but that's the way I look at it. If you uh, if you wanted to go to NTI and get in a gunfight, just like in the real world, if you want to get in a gunfight, you can do it. If you want to stay out of a gunfight, you can do it. Uh, remember Tom Givens talking about when when uh, John and I went and John Hearn and I went in 2007 uh, with Tom. Uh, he was saying that he would view it as a success if he got through the whole thing without ever having to pull his gun out. And you can very easily do that, or you can very easily get in a gunfight in just about every scenario that you put yourself in, depending on what decisions you make. Yeah, I would second that. The first year that I went that, um, well, that's not true. I was a top finisher several times, and in several of those, I did not fire a shot in the interactive portion of it. The first year you went, did they use the village that year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because early on, before any of us were going, they just had force and force exercises. And they realized that that was so artificial that people went into them knowing something's about to happen. They weren't seeing what they wanted to see. And they built the village so that you had to spend an hour in there. Mm -hmm. And you well, don't know when when it's coming. You you know, at least half your interactions in the village were benign, usually more than that. And which was, you know, something you don't see, you never saw anywhere else. It was really, the, I think, the only way to do what they wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. You spent a little over an hour in the village. And, uh, and that was part of it was to hopefully get people to where they couldn't maintain hypervigilance and you had you were forced into multiple interactions which is normal people doing normal things so tim why don't you talk a little bit about how the village worked and maybe help people understand what what you mean by going into the village and what it consisted of the village was literally a mock-up of a village it was probably an acre and a half two acres that was walled off limited access and had a framework of buildings in there. Um, it sometimes incorporated a fixed facility that had a roof and could be dark, uh, uh, but the bulk of it was outside. The buildings were very rudimentary, uh, but they would be labeled, you know, this is a restaurant and there'd be a table and a chair for you to go in there and sit. This is where you pick up your dry cleaning. This is the bank. And when you went to the village, you would be uh, removed of all your weapons and issued a SIM gun. And usually, you know, five, six rounds of ammo, depending on how many your weapon carried. And set out with the judge who basically escorted you through the village and would issue your task. So you'd walk in, there'd be four practitioners in there simultaneously, each with their own judge, each eventually going to do the same task, um, but not, not at the same time. So, and they'd have it set up where in one section of the village, you'd have one planned interaction and another one, you'd have another. And so you'd each be shuffled out to your interaction. So you're all in there at the same time, but you, you, you're never with other practitioners. You're always with the role players and the judge and they throw you into these situations and you have to handle them. Um, and, you know, the situation ranged from uh, an emotionally disturbed person who wanted to commit suicide and uh, to a guy who wanted directions uh, to a guy who wanted to stick you up and take your money or kidnap uh, your loved one that you had been tasked with protecting. So, and there would be, you know, some of each benign and, and malignant in your run through there. Usually, I think usually three or four um, fairly significant interactions. Um, but some of those could be handled very simply by 
saying, you know, this isn't someplace I want to be. And you turn and leave. And, and frequently in the village, that was uh, that was the uh, school solution, but not always. There were stages that uh, that you were forced into, and different years ran differently as well, and different role players. Uh, the very first year that I attended was at Gunsight, and the role players were all members of Yavapai County SWAT team. And uh, there were a couple of stages that were designed to trap you into a, a gunfight, whether, well, so one of them that year was uh, you came in and sat down uh, in a pizza restaurant. You were supposed to, your wife called or your, your significant other called and told you to pick up the pizza before you came home. You arrived. They said, it isn't ready yet. Have a seat. Uh, you were forced to sit at the table and then two guys came in one who uh, blocked the door and the other one proceeded to get in an argument and then uh, assault the uh, the owner of the establishment so you are present for a gunfight whether you choose to participate in that gunfight or not was up to you uh, but you were going to be present for uh, for that fight so some of them were were uh, ones you could totally talk your way out of and others uh you uh would have a harder time doing it but uh but even then uh i escaped that venue uh by positioning and uh waiting until attention went a different direction and i was able to exit without without firing but um you said something early on and that is that in most in many of these in the later years in particular there were a couple of you know, there were four graded events I, I learned once I was there helping run it. There were four graded events in the uh, in the village, but you had multiple people in there that were not uh, engaging in role, direct role play in those events at any time. So they would be engaging in benign interactions with you constantly as well. So you couldn't go in well, you could, but it was pretty unrealistic if you went in there and treated everybody like a, a potential adversary. Um the gal giving you your uh, your dry cleaning, for example, or the teller in the bank, or you know whoever. So, yeah, good Thank stuff. You, uh, so we pay a lot of lip service to stuff in 2023 in the training industry. The NTI was testing those topics that we discuss way back then. Uh, a couple of examples I can think of from my personal experience was I was given the job of like go to a bank and I can't remember was conduct some activity, regardless of what it was. As I'm sitting there waiting in line. Um, I see this guy that's like, he's getting ready to rob the bank. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm ready to get into a gunfight. And then the next thing I realize is I see the layup man over there. And I'm like, I just looked real quick and I'm like, I can't win this one, <laughs> you know? And, and, and a certain party just goes, you know, Hey, I'm, you know, you take, take the max money, do all that you want. Um, I, I don't know how I ever pulled this one off, but, uh, you know, Craig Douglas talks a lot about verbal agility. There was one of the interactions where I think I went into a pawn shop and, uh, there's two guys conducting business in front of me and there's what is appears to be a very large bag of cocaine being exchanged. And you were kind of put in the conundrum. Well, what do you see when you you're in this, you know, inhospitable place, you can't escape. Um, you've got these obvious criminals involved in this stuff. And they're like, you know, you don't run screaming to the police. I have no idea where this came from, but when they offered me some of this stuff, I'm like, man, I'm sorry. If I piss hot one more time, my old lady's going to kill me, which was a great response, which is, hey, I'm a criminal too. I'm trying to straighten narrow. I've done time. I'm on probation. I can't do this stuff anymore. I have no idea where that came from, but it certainly saved my bacon in there. And that's not the kind of material that you would typically be tested on uh, in any kind of competition event. But that's the kind of stuff that that's really important um, to have the potential to learn from. And again, as y'all have mentioned, by, by having you perform any large number of routine events, you had no, they did a really good job of, you know, making sure you didn't know what was coming. What were your experiences like in the uh, the village, Randy? Um, I, I'm sitting here thinking benign events. Where, where did these happen at? Uh, if I remember correctly, <laughs> the first one um, that we went to, uh, Tom Givens and I went into a school to supposedly give a speech. And then two guys come in, one with a gas can and one with a lighter. And so we pretty much just kind of end up shuffling all the little ladies out the door. Uh, and that was pretty much, you know, that one. Um, the next one, uh, they, because the the scenario that 
Skip read out at the beginning of it is you're you've come to this town. You're an expert witness. At some point, you're going to have to go to court and testify. So uh, the next thing, I'm in court, and there's a drunk guy sitting next to me trying to hand me a bottle. I'm like, no, I'm I'm good. Uh, and then the bailiff comes in, and then another guy comes in behind the bailiff, shoots them. They fall down and drop a Smith 5900 series pistol right at my feet, but I look down and notice that the safety's on. So I'm like, yeah, it's probably got an empty chamber too, uh, knowing this place. So I waited until the, the gunman got close enough within like a step of me and I jumped up and disarmed him. Um, the next one, I find myself meeting the DA for lunch and uh, I'm sorry, we're going to lunch and two guys uh, come in and uh, hem me in in a hallway and try to rob me. Um, and then the last one was I'm meeting the DA for lunch and the t same two guys and their female accomplice come in and try to accost me and the DA. So I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, where did these benign contacts happen at? It must have been a different year. Any many other experiences in the village that really stand out for you? Uh, for me? Um, yeah, just the... It, this is just kind of an interesting side note there while we're waiting to go into one of the venues uh talking about the judges that follow you around we're just kind of making small talk and uh he says i can tell where people are from by how they react to things in the force on force activities and i was like really that's interesting tell me tell me more about this and he says well people from the southwest they will normally warn you one time and then shoot you uh, people from the Northeast, I just about have to zap them with a cattle prod to get them to, to pull a gun on somebody. People from the South will shoot you without talking to you. And I was like, well, you know why that is? It's because we're largely descendants of Scots-Irish, and we would move inland away from the, the cities, and we basically lived on Indian land. If we had a problem, we largely had to get our brothers and cousins together and go handle it ourselves. And that's the uh, that's the blood that's still running through our veins. And he said, I'd never really thought of it that way, but so there are some interesting conversations between the events. What about you, Tim? Uh, what else from the village from you? The, you know, the, I, I went through the village so many times. Um, you know, there were there are a number of instances that that have stuck with me. There were a few times that. I did things that I intentionally did that I would have never have done just to see, can I do this? Um, you know, it, it, as a rule, I don't think it's a great idea to be drawing on a drawn gun. Um, but in the village, you have an opportunity to do it against someone who, who kind of has an inkling that you just might do that. It's not a total surprise to the uh, role players that you're armed. And, um, and so you can actually see, yeah, it is, is action really faster than reaction? And yes, it is. Uh, you still need to watch your back when you do that um, because the guy behind you has all the time in the world to shoot you. But it, it can, in fact, uh, uh, work. Um, I The first time they talk about tacky psyche, yeah, they talk about tunnel vision. The first time I was in the village where they came into a room and I'm sitting in the restaurant and they put a J frame in my face and proned me out. Um, they shot the guy next to me, proned out. And when they did that, I decided that was probably a good indication that I needed to leave. Um, so I ran out of the room from a prone position. Uh, they got one shot off at me. It hit me in the calf. I did not slow down. And when they debriefed me, they said, what can you tell me? I said, it was it was a man and a woman. They were both white. Uh, and they put a gun on my face. They said, what can you tell me about the gun? I said, well, it was silver. They said, what caliber was it? And I'm like, it was big enough to crawl into. It was the biggest gun I've ever seen. <laughs> it was a J-frame. Um, but when they put it in me, I tunneled down. That was all I saw. And things started moving really slow. And it was like, oh, shit, this stuff really happens. 
it was interesting. I, uh, you're talking about experiencing tacky psyche. Um, I think a Sims round travels at about 300 feet per second. It's not smoking, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's moving right along. It's brisk. I literally watched a Sims round in slow motion. My eye tracked it continually as it went by. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing that we haven't talked about that was interesting is that, you know, the NTI also um, kind of anticipated the issues of, you know, dealing with law enforcement in a post shooting environment. Uh, there was always pres law enforcement, for lack of better words, present in the village. And part of the challenge was if you actually did use force, you had to be able to justify that. And I don't think any of us probably talked ourselves into jail, but apparently a fairly common occurrence was people would use force and start to run their mouths and then um, end up in jail for it. Um, any comments on that, guys? I never ended uh, up in jail. <laughs> I'll yeah, jump in real quick on the one where I uh, was at lunch with the BA um, after I shot both the guys that came in to uh, cost us uh, and the girl, uh, all three of them. Uh, the police officer came in and, you know, started like, well, you're carrying the gun and all this stuff. I said, you might want to take this up with the BA here who I just saved. And the BA was like, yeah, I don't think we're going to be pressing any charges here. So, so that worked out pretty well. Since it no longer runs, I, I can share a little bit here of uh, some of the things that they looked for uh, looking at uh, at one of the evaluation sheets and uh, specific to, well, actually it wasn't specific to the village, but things like environmental control skills, verbal, physical movement, uh, reading skills, reading the situation and people, judgment, response to threat, um, you know, in general, uh, how did you react to the threat? Those were all things that were were being looked at um, that are, you know, certainly not present in the vast majority of, I, I don't know any venues other than a very few courses that do force on force type of things that are are looking at that. And again, for for me, what was unique about the NTI was that here was an opportunity to be tested against somebody else's test. I, at the time, was a traveling trainer, was a full-time, well, actually, when I started going, I was still on active duty, and then I had a period of time was a full-time trainer, and you stand up in front of people, and you were looked upon correctly or not as the expert and the, the most knowledgeable person in the room, and, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, get to where you believe your own hype or uh, or at least have to react as as if you're the most knowledgeable person in the room because it's expected of you. Well, guess what? Here you get to go and take a test cold, somebody else's test, somebody else's grading system, somebody else's ideas of what's important and compare what you do and what you think uh, is important to that. And, uh, and, and that just is was absolutely unique to me to uh, have the opportunity to do that. So that was what was really cool. And the, the force on force stage or the interactive uh, assessment stage allowed so much of reading the environment and stuff that I believe from my experience is far more useful and far more important and more predictive of success or failure in the real world than you know, whether my split is is two tenths faster than yours is pretty insignificant uh, when the when the air is full of of projectiles. Um, yeah, you want to be seconds from the problem, not quarter seconds uh, ahead. And uh, the NTI allowed you to examine that. That's specifically those interactive stages. So the first time I went through the NTI, let me share this real quick. I think it's important for the audience to understand this. I went through the NTI for the first time in 2005. And I'd been reading about it in gun magazines, how it was this premier training event. And I went through the village and came out. And I was, for lack of better words, disappointed. I've been told about how there was all this information that you could read situations, all this other kind of thing. And I'm like, man, I didn't experience any of that. Well, it happened to be that that year Tom was writing a magazine article. So I actually got to follow, go through the village a second time as a photographer. And when, as soon as I wasn't worried about dying, there was a ton of environmental information out there. For instance, in the year that year happened, there was like the, the, the village had gangs. 
And there was, if you were paying attention, there was gang graffiti. There was red and there was blue. And the first time you're going through that environment, um, I'm like, well, this is stupid. There's none of these, none of the stuff that I've been told about was going on. It's like, oh, it was there. I was just, it was an overwhelming experience. And I think that, you know, to nerd out here for a second is that, you know, you have to go through these novel experiences to be able to deal with them. And, you know, the huge value of the NTI was to give you that an experience in a fairly consequence free environment as far as that goes. Um, you know, that John, you know, those are the, the skills that we don't really talk about anymore, but awareness of gang graffiti, the environment, you know, just being able to read signs, uh, patterns of people's movements, all that sort of thing. Um, that that's the stuff that's really, really important. It allows you to get ahead of the game uh, and not be in bad places when bad things are happening, which is generally the better solution. Yeah, absolutely. And then it, so all of that, absolutely accurate. And then add two pieces to it. You you mentioned reading people, but reading people and their movement in the environment and realizing, you know, again, I got to see it going back and and helping run stages. And, um, you know, people getting in shootouts with cover one step away and standing in the open the draw takes time, folks. There, there, nobody has an instantaneous draw. I don't care if it takes one second. In that one second, you could have at least covered a couple of steps. And, you know, people standing in the open to to draw, people uh, tunnel visioning in on one individual who's being loud and totally missing that there was some interaction between him and another person that should have told you that they're together and that you need to split your attention between the two of them. And people go through and sometimes it was painfully obvious. They got shot by the second guy as, as has been mentioned other times he didn't shoot you, but it was noted that, uh, you know, they, for whatever reason, conserving sim ammo or whatever, didn't bother to shoot you, but he was standing behind you the whole time. It could have, and you never even knew he was there. So, yeah, that that is the stuff that, in my opinion, makes the difference in so many circumstances. And we need to look for ways to to train it and test it and evaluate it. What were your thoughts there? The director of me. Yeah, you had your hand raised, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, what I was going to do is just throw in, um, we might drop back just a little bit and talk about how people got to participate in it because for the folks out there that maybe don't know that so do you want to talk about that for just a second randy tell us how you got to participate in that oh well okay we can talk about how i got to participate um basically tom given said you know hey you really ought to go to this is like yeah i've been reading about it for years in the gun magazines and you know like every year um john farnham if you're on his mailing list um thing he would do a little um you know, uh, after action report about it. Um, he had several articles in magazines, Masada, you did articles about it all the time. So I was pretty well familiar with it up until that point. And Tom was like, you know, yeah, we're going to go in, uh, you know, this year it was in 2007. He's like, you know, why don't you, uh, go with us? And so I was like, okay, cool. You know, tell me what I need to do. So they send you a, uh, uh, essentially a, um, like, a what the word I'm looking for, uh, essentially a form to fill out with, yeah, uh, form to fill out with, card. yeah, uh, your training background and and all of that stuff. Basically, asking for a for an invite, and uh, I think you had to have somebody else that had already been or something uh, put in a good word for you too, which Tom did, and that's that's how I got into it. So, yeah, I can flesh that out a little bit. So you uh, you had to turn in basically you know, a, a brief training resume. And that was just for the most part uh, to make an evaluation that people could be expected to perform safely um, in, in that environment. And then where I thought you were going as well, sometimes some years they sent it out ahead of time. Others, uh, I guess more often you did it at the event, you filled out your, your, uh, your man card where you're, you're it was a silhouette of a, of a, an individual and you had to list all the equipment that you were going to have. And the, the point there was that you need to come as you and that the you we're talking about is the everyday you, uh, the everyday carry you, not the how I dress to go to my IDPA competition you or how I dress to go to my 
uh, other competition you. Um, you could be, if you're a cop and you wanted to come as a cop and come with your duty rig, that was fine. Um, otherwise, you were expected to not dress for the party, to uh, come with the stuff that you that you had. Um, the invitation, as you say, was mostly to, my understanding, to evaluate that people could could do it safely. And then uh, depending upon the year, it was over a hundred participants um, a couple of years, and then uh, it got cut down uh, some years to significantly less than that as well. So they controlled the number of of people that were that received invitations as well. The uh, as far as the come um, as you are kind of thing, I wore uh, just the regular uh, like a polo shirt and. Um, you know, cargo shorts and inside the waistband holster, a pocket holster for my backup gun, you know, flashlight, uh, you know, fake pepper spray. That, that's the, the stuff that I normally carry on an everyday basis. I don't normally carry which, fake pepper spray, but, you know, they wouldn't yeah. let you use pepper spray. <laughs> which so kind big of clear on that. So. Yeah. Which kind of, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, what, whether I had some concepts, uh, what, what was shaped when? And, uh, you know, this comes out now. I heard uh, actually a conversation, um, John, when you were talking about folks that came to a class that you put on and, you know, whether people should wear concealment or not, whether people should, you know, to me, I guess, I guess I'm just boringly simple. Uh, my only interest in this stuff is actual daily use of this stuff. So I get up and get dressed. And whether I was going to the NTI or whether I'm going to work today or whatever, get up and get dressed. And that's that's it. That's the gun. That's the holster. That's the clothing. That's that is what and that was really there were people who obviously didn't do that at the NTI. And frankly, they uh, the people putting it on, let them know that uh, they didn't think much of that approach um you know you were asked to come like you would be on a on a particular day and uh if you came with a bunch of extra shit uh it was generally pretty obvious the other thing that i can tell you was very obvious from sitting through debriefings uh of the team afterwards it was universally noted the people who brought a bunch of extra stuff seldom were able to access it in under stress um, if it wasn't part of their daily equipment, they had that second gun and they never thought to go for it when their primary ran dry. Uh, if they asked for fake pepper spray to go in the village, but they never really carried it. Yeah. They never reached for it in their pocket when it would have been appropriate, appropriate in a scenario. I think Sarah's have had the benefit of listening to Skip's talk about his experiences with the NTI. And that was one of the points I was going to bring up. It was like the amazing amount of people that would, um, you know, bring a backup gun, wear it through the live fire events. And um, one of the things that the NTI did was they limited how much ammunition you could carry. So if you're carrying a double stack gun, you were limited to the magazine of the gun plus one spare. If you were a single stack shooter, you were allowed to, to carry two spare magazines. And it was not uncommon, especially if you were missing a lot, for people to go through and completely run the gun empty. And they'd be like, well, I guess I'm done with the scenario. I'm completely out. And they'd be like, well, what about that J-frame on your ankle? Doesn't it still have bullets? And people would be like, you know, dude, I, you know, I guess it does. And, uh, you know, the other thing that Skip mentioned was that, you know, again, this goes back to training is that everybody talks about firing failure drills and headshots, but on several of the live, you know, several of the stages, there would be targets that only responded to headshots. And apparently the number of people who would dump the entire contents of, you know, what they were carrying ammunition wise into, into the chest of a target, like literally empty a magazine, reload and empty it again without ever transitioning to the head um, was fairly common apparently and it's those little you know i don't know if we, we use the word training scars but it's certainly a failure to actually train uh to think about these things and be prepared to execute the next thing uh that, that the nti really really exposed i've lost my reaction thing so i don't know how to raise my fingers anymore but um that failing to transition to a headshot that wasn't just in the live fire uh, tactical TEDs, because they would have some of them set up 
usually if you looked, you could see that they were wearing a vest and they would only fall to a headshot. But he also had a standard pretty much every year where he had a steel target that required two body shots and then a headshot. And he told, or they told you, this drill is two to the body and one to the head. And they would still have people empty their magazine at the body, even after, even after being told what the drill is. So it wasn't just that they didn't recognize what they were supposed to to do it wasn't that they weren't trained to do headshots it was they wouldn't even transition to a headshot when they were told they were supposed to transition to a headshot i don't know if that's stress or if it's uh, that they just don't do headshots would you have to say sir um, i'm a firm believer and you're going to train what you've trained to do and you're not going to train or you're not going to do what you've not trained to do um uh, real quick let me hit on the backup gun thing um uh, as far as ammo capacity and everything goes i carried at that point i was carrying every day of my life a glock 34 uh with a 19 round mag in it so that's 20 in the gun plus another 19 on the belt i never shot through a whole magazine um in the in any of the scenarios much less pulled the backup gun and of the four or five of us that went i think uh john justice said that he ran his 1911 empty and pulled his backup gun instead of reloading it on one stage. But that was the only, the, the year that we were there, um, there just wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to, or at least I didn't think there was a whole lot of opportunity to miss enough to run through two high cap mags and your backup gun. That would have taken some effort. Um, and then real quick on the headshots thing, uh, and and John Holshen can, can verify this one. I'm not just pulling this one out of somewhere. Um, the year that we were there, they had installed the targets, the skipper target, um, which John can probably explain this better than I can. Uh, it's a somewhat realistic 3D target with a uh, something in the center of it that holds PV or uh, holds a pea gravel, and the bullet impact of that would knock them over. Well this particular year they had not in them in the targets to the right height so they stopped at about the teeth and didn't go up to the nose and the eyes well on one of the stages where we had to pick up a mystery gun that's i'm sure we're going to talk about that later on uh the whole mystery gun concept at, at nti um you're in a school the school resource officer is down you pick up his gun and work your way out while the school's being attacked by terrorists so you know, you're in this uh, 360 degree range by yourself with a headset talking to the range officer um, because it's the way they did that. It wasn't really safe to have two people in there at the same time because you can shoot in 360 degrees. So I'm engaging this target. I shoot it in the head. It doesn't fall down. I shoot it again. It doesn't fall down. I shoot it again. It doesn't fall down. And so I start talking to the range master. I'm like, hey, I've hit this thing three times. It's not going down. They're like, well, just shoot it better basically and i was like i can see a hole through his left eye socket i can see the <laughs> wall behind him he's not falling down and they're like oh we may have a target problem then um so i end up running that gun empty um i pick up a fake knife that's laying there so i basically had to stab the rest of the targets as i went past them get to the last guy who's a gun uh, who's a uh, another gun armed terrorist standing in the doorway I'm like, well, crap, what am I going to do here? So I was like, well, I got a perfectly functional uh, uh, thing to throw at them. So I jump out from behind the wall, throw the pistol at them, and knock the mannequin over, run up, uh, stab him a bunch of times in the neck, and run out the door. And uh, so that's that's how I got out of that one. But that whole, um, there was another scenario where you're in an airport, and you end up picking up an AR-15, and shooting the terrorists with it, well, they don't fall down because I shot them in the head. Um, and again, I'm not thinking, like John said, there's stuff that you don't notice when you know, you're know you worried about dying. Um, and uh, you know, I, it completely slipped my mind that two stages earlier, we determined that you can't shoot them in the head. So I do what I'm immediately gonna do and shoot these guys at 15 yards in the head. They don't fall over. And uh, the judge there is just saying, well, you know, I think you probably missed them. And I was like, 15 yards with a rifle. And so we walked out there and there's a bunch of two, two, three holes, you know, in the forehead and in the eyes. And he was like, Oh, uh, that's a target malfunction. 
So anyways, that's just one of those things that particular year, even if you did shift to headshots, they weren't always going to go down simply because of the way it got set up. So. Yeah. Sounds like uh, definitely some, some targetry issues. So speaking of that, uh, the, uh, those, those were called, they got nicknamed the terrible Ted and uh, it was, you know, they had those in, uh, in 19, I, I'm terrible with years. My wife laughs at me when I try and do years. Uh, but we were, we shot those at Gunsight. And Gunsight, last time the NTI was at Gunsight was in 96, 7, somewhere in that time frame. And so back in the 90s, here are guys that, that set out their criteria for a target and this was this is actually from uh, from Skip's lecture at TACON a few years ago. The target criteria was look there was to be lifelike, reactive, with relevant hit zones. Sorry about that, Randy. That were accessible 360 degrees of engagement. Um, they actually went to a company called Medical Plastics Laboratory that at the time was cutting edge. They were the first people that I knew of. I was an SF medic at the time, and they were making the original trauma mannequins that we used uh, for EMT training. And uh, they got those mannequins and they had them cored out so that basically in the chest and or the head, you could put, as you mentioned, a piece of uh, industrial hose that was filled with pea gravel. And then, and that was just the torso. It's set on a stand that you really couldn't see because you split a pair of jeans on the back seam and then you staple it onto the stand. So the legs are hanging there. The arms were actually really, really, really heavy gauge wire, like, you know, uh, the diameter of a pencil almost, but they ended in lifelike hands. So if you put a long sleeve shirt on it, um, you, you really couldn't tell there weren't arms in there. And then the hands could hold objects such as guns or cell phones or whatever. And um, if they want them to be body armor, they padded up what looked like body armor on it. And the pea gravel uh, hose filled uh, was only in the head. So you could shoot through. Unfortunately, as they wore over the years, and it sounds like somebody didn't check those and, uh, you know, people being human, the, uh, you, you had some, some targetry issues there, but, uh, I can tell you the first time I came around a corner and engaged one of those. And as my bullets are impacting it, you know, it would shake it and the, the arms being wire, it would kind of bobble. And, you know, so it, it's like the arms are moving with this gun in it. And in my mind, I'm like, I know that's not a person, but I've never shot any thing in like this that reacted that way before and it was a it was a bit of a uh it, it took a little moment of thinking about what was going on to uh to track that but one of the things you found with those just like a real person it takes about a second and a half to two seconds for it to fall down and if you're close enough and can shoot fast enough and you have trained to shoot them into the ground uh, you can expand six eight rounds easily on one of those when not miss with any of those rounds all of them are, are knocking them down and if you shot them through the body and it didn't hit that core well it would just kind of jiggle and and look at you and uh so it, it definitely caused people to uh to have to think about that um other targets i was just gonna say when i asked them about that um the answer about the them not falling to the headshot they're like Frankly, nobody normally shoots like that. Nobody's uh, shooting headshots, or you know, right off the bat. So it's not uh, something that we normally even have to worry about. So, see, Tim's was... got his hand up there. Yeah, my real hand. The most of the targets in the live fire were the tactical tents with the columns, and the exception. There was always one stage in the pneumatic house, and in the pneumatic house the mannequins would pop out and then disappear. And if you shot them for as long as they were exposed, you could go through a whole magazine on the first target because they would pop out and they'd stay out for three or four seconds, uh, which is forever. Um, and so if you've got two magazines, it's pretty easy to, to 
be down to next to nothing fairly soon. And they could be up to eight shoot targets in that house. Uh, I believe that was the max for the, the, the nomadic house. So, so yeah, the, the nomadic house, I took a different approach. Everybody in the nomadic house got a failure drill. And then I stopped. Because if I didn't, you know, I'm shooting a single stack. I'm going to run out of ammo uh, if, with the third target. Because I'm if I'm shooting it until it goes away, I'll be reloading when it goes away. But there was only one pneumatic house. Everything else had the uh, the, the terrible yeah, tests. A, a pneumatic house, and then there's another one that used uh, very, very targetry as well. And there were years that that targetry was on a track, for example, and it could follow you down the hall and around corners. And uh, if you was... were, got stationary too long in, in one place trying to deal with a problem, let's say to your right, and weren't paying attention, this target would come around a corner to your left. And uh, they purposefully built into the, the live fire stages as well that ability where there were targets that would come up after you passed um, and see that was why it was a 360 shoot house. Um, did, you, did you ever look behind you? Uh, you know, so many places because you can never allow to shoot behind you. Uh, people never develop those skills and they don't actually maintain 360 degree awareness. So um, they had targets. You'd start down a hall and uh, a target would appear after you behind you after you turned and the hall was like mm, 10 yards long and you're not moving fast because you're worried about what you're running into. So you were in that hall for many seconds and many people went through that hall and the target um, that had been behind them the whole time, you know, they never saw it. So of course they never engaged it. Um, they also had targets that appeared slowly um, at times so that there wasn't this rapid movement that caught your eye uh, and really tested where you, you know, you, there were numerous mechanisms to test whether you truly had 360 degree awareness or did not. And again, that's something that, you know, in many environment, many training classes and venues, we're just kind of getting back to that, um, that concept of 360 degree awareness. Um, yeah, truly uh, uh, ahead of their time in in that regard. One thing that uh, one really stood that out to me, um, one thing that really stood out to me as the NTI was just how impressive the target you was and how much it added to the experience. Because uh, I, there, everything, with few exceptions, was reactive, and if you shot it well, it went down quickly. But if it didn't, you didn't place good hits on it, it would stay there. And what amazed me was um, one of the things we had mentioned was there was a standard stage that was run every year as well. Uh, what we think of as a more traditional um, shooting event. But what was interesting about that was one year I went and looked and they had, you know, tactical heads on the front of these things. But the scoring zone was at the back. You know, there was a, basically a, a cardiac triangle. They didn't, you know, it was uh, you would engage these targets from different angles and they would ultimately account. They didn't care where the bullets went in the front. They actually were looking to see where the bullets actually went. Um, stuff like, you know, uh, one thing we haven't talked about is just they did a really good job of introducing noise and chaos and confusion. Um, you know, there would be explosions, there would be devices in the middle of the event to make you process. And we make these sound like these, they're these simple shooting problems, but when you layer on all these things, it's quite amazing. I think one of the most interesting things they ever did in the 360 shoot house was you were entering a room and a hand grenade ended up in it. And you had to sit there and go, oh, crap, that's a hand grenade. I need to move to cover. And, you know, after having run that and talking to people, just most people don't have a parking place in their head for a hand grenade in the room, let alone responding to it properly. And, you know, it's things like that that tended to weed people out fairly quickly. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was there was, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about is not projecting the, the weapon too far as you're moving through a structure. One year, there was actually like a rubber arm holding a rubber hammer, and it would swing at you. You know, it, I think it act trip no matter what. And whether you got hit by the hammer or not was largely determined about how far you were projecting the gun in front of you. So, again, a, a great way to ensure that you're actually following um, the, the habit you're supposed to, that you're not going to get checked in, in any other way as far as that goes. Um, other thoughts that I had about uh, it was interesting is that in the latter years, you were able to uh, videotape some of these runs. And I'll try to push these up on the, the Facebook page. Um 
it was absolutely amazing to me going back and looking at the videos, uh, how when you're clearing a, a, a true 360 degree structure and you're worried about all those things, there is no standard shooting position. Um, one of the things that amazed me going back through it at the time I was a, I would think of myself as a modified weaver shooter. I was in every conceivable shooting position that you could imagine from a classic isosceles to just straight up car. I mean, I was working like a hard left hand corner. I, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the video later going, what the hell am I doing? But it made sense in the, because I was, you know, my actions were being driven by the environment that I would, you know, keep as much of myself behind cover and try to work that corner. So I, I found the videotaping of the scenarios to be really, really useful as well. What I was going to throw in just a second ago was the when John Holshan was talking about um, lack of 360 degree awareness. I think one of the I think the term gets overused sometimes, but one of the training scars of square range training um, is, you know, largely people are not allowed to turn around and look behind them. Uh, you've got to keep the gun facing into the berm. Um, we, we know there are safe ways to turn around with the gun, but in most places, it's just not going to happen. They just won't allow it. So people get drilled into them. Everything is in front of you. Well, for reals, everything is not always in front of you. And you got to be able to check all, all around. Um, and you need to be able to do that safely. Yeah. The, um, you know, it amazes me how people, um, you know, we, we want to think we, we recognize that the training that we do intentionally has the possibility of getting us to a point of unconscious performance. We recognize that. We desire that. We make that an objective that, well, this is a training objective and I'm going to do it. And people don't think about how that happens. And, and really just simple. It's repetition. Uh, that's how you got to be able to drive a car unconsciously without thinking about how much steering input and how much brake input. It's repetition. Yet people, the same people will argue that these other things, because I didn't make them a conscious training objective, oh, no, that's not going to get trained in. I'm not going to do that automatically. Yeah, you are. The reality of it is that if training works, it works. If you do something thousands of times, you will do it that way when you're not thinking about it. And you, the idea um, that you're, you're going to be able to break that, it's just, it's just fallacious. Um, the other thing, John, that you mentioned or that you made me think of when you mentioned the, the chaos and uh, two points, the chaos and reading. Several of the live fire stages uh, had verbal interaction with a, a role player, um, whether that was over a, uh, a speaker or later uh, with a headset in some cases. So, for example, you're coming around or in some cases, whether it was simply the, the judge facilitating. So you come around and every target with a gun was not necessarily a threat. And some of them had a badge, but some of them didn't have a badge and they also weren't a threat. And so you had the ability um, both to interact with them and uh, and there were soundtracks playing on some stages. Some of them were recorded. Most often they were not. They were triggered by a, an RO that was in a position to see when to say things. And but audio exclusion was was real. And uh you know, if you are before you go into a room, you can hear two voices. One's clearly male and one's clearly female. And one of them is clearly uh, by what you can hear appears to be the victim. Um, but then people go around the corner and shoot both of them. Um, you know, they they were not aware of uh, of anything that was going on in their audible uh, senses in in many cases as well. So the other thing is there are a lot of things that were thrown in that you might say, well, you know, as an everyday person, what's the chance I'm going to come across to a hand grenade? Frankly, in some of the things that were thrown in, you weren't actually being graded on your ability to deal with a hand grenade. And you may have in that, that particular year, but there were stuff that was thrown in there simply to see what happened when you were throwing curveballs that you hadn't thought about before. And when we say, see what happened, we don't just mean relative to that event. Did your 
relids then go to go to shit? Did your accuracy then degrade significantly? Did your so there were a bunch of things that were thrown in that the sole purpose was, as Skip said here in a in a quote, the point was to test the practitioner and the durability of his training if things were not going as planned. Um, and that kind of brings us to the mystery gun stage as well. It wasn't about, and we'll explain what that was, but it wasn't about, could you run that gun? It's what, when we take a bunch of your mental processing ability and tie it up with something, what's left and what impact does that have on your performance? Well, I'll chime in at 2.3. You mentioned the mystery gun. The other thing that I thought the NTI did that was interesting is because as while we all claim to be, you know, great big barrel chested freedom fighters and we're never unarmed, the reality is you're going to be unarmed at certain points in your life. And the fact, you know, some of the stages would require that you be in a non permissive environment where you are not allowed to have guns. And they rolled that into one that I recall where you were basically at your doctor's office and you were, you know, wear, basically wearing an examination robe. So there was no way to carry a gun. And things go crazy. And I think there was like a 410 shotgun that had been plugged. Uh, so that it couldn't hold many rounds. So you were literally having to uh, pick up a one of those square lantern flashlights and a, basically it was effectively a single shot pump 410 and make your way through the structure. And it was a it was an interesting combination. I get to that point, you know, how well do you improvise and carry on? Because I thought for sure as I'm I could not figure out how to get another round into the tube because it would make sense to top up the shotgun. But apparently um, they had plugged it just to see whether plugging a shotgun would screw with you. And the answer is yes. Yes, it does. Because I'm sitting here trying to figure out how to get this next round in. So I, I guess they had the desired effect. Yeah. The other thing that I thought was interesting is uh, now that you say that, John, it makes a lot more sense. One of the, In one year, one of the stages was uh, you retrieved an AR from the airport. And you were given the combination. So while all this stuff was going on, you had to run up, open it up. And when you get it out, it was actually like, uh, I can't remember who made it. It was a left-handed AR. Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> stag arm. <laughs> left-handed yeah, AR. Left I remember AR, like, what? I had that on my stage one year, the stage that I ran. Yeah, I, I have pictures of you, actually, when I was digging through. But it was just weird because, like, I'm, oh, well, that's a left-handed AR. I guess I, I put a magazine in it and run the charging handle. It'll, it'll run like any other AR, which it did. But. That was the kind of stuff that, that was absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, the the pickup gun stage that Randy mentioned, that was like a, a Ruger. You know, it was not what you would have picked. And I only found out afterwards, like, you know, there were rounds in the gun, but apparently nobody took the extra magazine off the security guard. You know, you weren't just limited to the rounds in the gun. But, you know, there was a spare magazine you could have taken as well. And so many people would fixate on, oh, it's a mystery gun and not even worry about extra ammunition. So it really was an environment that tested a lot of those split-second decisions making. Um, I was recognized as a, a top practitioner um, in 06, and I'm fairly convinced that the only reason that happened that year was because of the pneumatic stage. And this is what's interesting is in that particular year, you started out in the bathroom of a restaurant and things went crazy. And you're coming up on what was marked as the kitchen, and this pneumatic target pops out right in front of you. And it appears to be in its hand a very large knife. And almost everybody shot that target. I didn't because it came out of the room marked kitchen and it had an apron on. And I'm pretty sure that the fact that I did not shoot that guy saved me. And what was really interesting, and I didn't realize this, I was looking at some of the pictures. I thought that the dude had a great big knife. Apparently, he just had a pizza slice, the, the spatula you lift the pizza slice up, which looked a lot like a knife. So it was, you know, it was an interesting test of, you know, could you realize contextually that's the guy with an apron with a large silver object? in a restaurant probably doesn't need to be shot. And apparently he got shot a lot that year. Yep. Absolutely. Puts things in a very different context from uh, just shooting skills. Well, I was going to jump in real shoot. quick with yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, talking about the mystery gun stuff. Uh, what I had was a double barrel uh, exposed hammer shotgun with the square lantern to carry around so you know you uh you're sitting there in the exam room and all heck break loose and you jump up and snatch up the double barrel off the ground and then there's probably maybe eight shells uh laying there if you saw them and picked them up so i just scoop it all up stuck it in my pocket 
um, having been extremely familiar with a double barrel shotgun at that point, it was no big deal. The hardest thing was just kind of combining using that big light and the uh, shotgun at the same time. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, more realistically, I guess it's there. I noticed they're bird shot. They're not buckshot. So I then went through and shot everything in the face with it. And uh, of course, at the end of the week, when they do the big um, after action report and he, the guy who's running each stage does his debrief, he's you know, says and, and one of the practitioners actually shot them all in the face. And I was like, um, can I explain that? That's that gun's loaded with birdshot. And if we're reliably gonna stop people, uh, we probably need to do that. So it's, he he was just all horrified that someone was essentially shooting them like you would shoot turkeys. So <laughs> one of the other things about the, the NTI and the way the evaluations went is that yeah, well, uh, you know, human beings are human beings and the people running it as well. And different years were different. But in general, um, you know, after the stage, you're given a debrief and the opportunity to explain what you did uh, as well. And uh, and and they learned from it. And, you know, several times um, judges mentioned that they had learned something from something I had done and mentioned they'd learned things from from different practitioners as well. And uh, the uh, the other one, if that was the same shotgun, there were different guns used. Every, yeah, every year was a different gun, obviously. And uh, people unfamiliar with it, every time you break it open and close it again, it automatically puts the safety back on. And uh, there were lots of folks that would step around the corner and attempt to to fire and uh, and be frustrated as heck because they how the safety get back on i know i took that safety off yeah but then you reloaded dude and that put the safeties back activated so one of the quiz i was going through i've got pictures and stuff like that the other thing that nobody's mentioned uh so far is you could actually get shot during the live fire exercises which is an, an absolutely novel concept um i've got pictures i thought it was genius they developed these uh pvc guns that fired basically earplugs using a shotgun primer and it was absolutely, I actually had one of those, it actually got so close that it disturbed the hairs on my hand. But that's the kind of thing you're never getting in any other venue outside of possibly the NTI. Uh, they went to great lengths to make this as realistic as possible. And it's like, I think that probably that earplug shotgun or that earplug gun was set up right at the very edge of the cover. So it was like more or less like mm -hmm. as a check for make sure you're using cover. Um an amazing amount of detail and thought that went into making this whole thing take place. Uh, so yeah, throw out there and I'll throw out for comments. Cause I know John saw some of these, uh, you talked about shooting skills. The NTI did require some pretty good shooting skills, especially in the terms of long range pistols. Does anyone want to comment on long range pistol at the NTI? <laughs> I can remember not pistol, but, uh, on a, stage that we recovered a, a rifle and had about um gosh i don't know what how long 250 yard shot maybe something like that and uh yeah i one reason or another i generally am fairly competent with a rifle but i could not hit that damn thing uh with that rifle but yeah there were there were pistol shots i don't remember 65 75 yards at least uh 84, 84 one on the ridge Say again. Mm -hmm. 84 one year. I, yeah. I I was reviewing my notes the other day. Uh -huh. This is before red dots on pistols, kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was iron sights. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah, well, that reminds me of one year the uh the battlefield recovery stage was uh I think it was a 308 rifle. It was a bolt action rifle, bottom line. And that year you had on the uh the, the gown turned inside out so there were no pockets so you had to hold the spare ammo in your hand while you were also trying to manipulate this thing and uh that rifle had no sights on it at all and the final shot was maybe 35 yards or so out the back of the shoot house and it was amazing how many people uh, i'm told got to that point before they discovered the fact that the rifle had no sights uh, when they first recovered it and went through the whole shoot house, it wasn't until they needed to make this 35 yard shot that they brought it up and looked at it, then took it down and said things like the sights came off. It's like, no, they never, never had sights. 
we're going to leave this out here. We need to start to wrap up. So I want you to talk about the logistics that were involved in this endeavor. Uh, what are the thoughts that we have before we start to wrap up and talk about the logistics that just took them to put this thing on? Because one of the Facebook questions were like, well, why why isn't nobody doing this anymore? So yeah. any other topics we need to cover? Uh, you know, one of the things I had in my notes was it was interesting because disarming people was an option at the NTI, which meant that you actually had to be thinking about it as an option. But also, they weren't giving me. I think you basically had to touch the gun and say disarm. And it was just little things like that, being able to read those proxemics as far as making that successful disarm. But again, you just didn't get anywhere else. Yeah, it's on the one that um, where I had that happen, um, I had just kind of in the talking to other people afterwards, you know, several people had said they were close to it, but because they had never done any disarm training, that it just didn't really cross their mind. You know, they were still focused on how am I going to get that gun off the floor and use it? And, you know, whereas the clear, I thought the clear solution was simply jump up, grab dude's gun. Um, but at that point, got to keep in mind, you're going to do what you're training to do. At that point, I'd already trained with William April and disarms, trained with Suarez and disarms, trained with South Narc and disarms. So that was all, you know, pretty well in my wheelhouse. Whereas maybe for a lot of other folks, it just may not be. And, you know, you're going to do what you, what you know. Yep. Yeah, I think to me, the summary is that that when I, I get a lot of questions and I get a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, probing questions or um, I, how should I put it? Questions that are coming from a point of view of, of rather negativity uh, about uh, you know, how did, well, there was so much subjectivity, uh, you know, how did, uh, how did, you know, that's not fair. How do you know that he got graded the same as the other person? And, uh, they were called judges for a reason. And, uh, again, there was no intent to compare one practitioner against another. I believe in the very first one that I was told I had to leave. I was in the middle of a, uh, of a permanent change of station being transferred to Fort Lewis, Washington, to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, to teach at the special forces school. And I literally, I did my day, uh, the, the event you shot all day and uh, I did my day and then I went to the airport and I left. So I didn't know anything about how anything until people started calling me and saying, Hey, you know, you were recognized as a top shooter. And I thought they said that there was a list, but I, I don't know. In later years, what I do know is talking to Skip and others. And again, it was never meant to compare one, one participant to another. The purpose of recognizing the people that did well was so that other people could examine those people's training regime, what schools they had trained at, and who they had trained with and how they got to this point to where at the NTI, the team assessed them as being in the upper level of competency. And if those people were trainers, then obviously people might want to train with them. Uh, but in many cases, they weren't trainers at, at the time. And it was, but who did they train with and how did they get there? So it really wasn't about trying to compare one person's experience to the next. It was about giving each individual the opportunity to be tested. And no, the test may not be identical for each person for various reasons. Uh, in later years, I can tell you that the way the village worked, there were certain events that had to happen in certain places, like the courthouse, for example. But there were other events. You were going to get mugged. Whether you got mugged at the gas station or you got mugged between the, uh, you know, the uh, the the post office and the bank didn't matter. Uh, you were going to get mugged, and it was just based on how the other encounters went. So, people's experiences were never intended to be identical at it. And uh, some people got very frustrated even at the NTI. People that came from a strong competition background. And, you know, we're prone to say things like, that's not fair. And, well, I didn't know that. And, um, yeah, the NTI folks really weren't concerned with that. And they really didn't understand why the practitioner was. Uh, that's what they called the people going through the practitioner. So that, that'd be kind of my closing you, you thoughts know, on that aspect of it. The, the NTI was brutal on your ego. Um, 
and you, you really had to take it as a learning experience uh, because otherwise you, you'd just be demoralized. Uh, there were just too many opportunities for you to do things wrong. Uh, so looking at it as a learning experience allowed you to grow with it and benefit from it. And I, I was clearly much better at the end of my time there than I was at the beginning in, in largely because this wasn't novel anymore. I, you know, I'd been through things like this before. It was great for that. Well, one of the questions that we had would be, why isn't this thing done anymore? And I'm, I'll throw some comments out there, but John knows this behind. I think it's a combination of things that made this possible. I think that number one, we had that, they had the venue there and they had a range, basically a nice shooting range that could be taken over for over a week. I think that what most people don't appreciate was that there was a study group there that met once a month. And those were the people that ran the match. So this was a year round endeavor. They would be squatted as a team to run the pneumatic stage or to do this. This was literally uh, a core of volunteers uh, that worked on this project year round. Um, things that I thought that it was interesting. Um, it was based in a Northeast gun club. Uh, I don't see these deep South as much, but one of these long-term you know, gun clubs that have been there for a hundred years, uh, you did have the volunteers with really good blue collar skills. that could pull this off just the amount of stuff that had to be stored. There was a Connex container, you know, you had to erect the walls, you had a 360 degree shoot house. Um, and I think that the key to the NPI was those volunteers that made everything tick. Um, we were talking about what it would take to put on equivalent experience. And, you know, if you would like to, you know, a ticket that cost five or $7,000, you could probably do something in today's dollars. But, you know, that staffing was absolutely amazing. John, did you want to share some other comments there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's even, uh, I can amplify a little bit. The, the core folks, actually met weekly there were a couple of uh, of groups and actually there was at some period of time uh skip said that they actually had two events a week tuesday and thursday night and uh, so you've got these folks that are showing up and they started off with various types of you know shooting club and it, it, it evolved into this so you had weekly participants then you had monthly participants, the study group that met on the, the third Saturday of every month. And that drew people. The location is between York and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So you're in striking distance. You're in driving distance from New York City, from the major cities in uh, New Jersey, from Baltimore, from D.C. Uh, you had people who were involved in law enforcement, in intelligence community, in various functions that participated in the monthly study group event. Every study group consisted of three uh, sessions that ran simultaneously, and then you rotated among them. There was a live fire stage. There was an interactive stage, or what we would now call force on force. And there was a, a lecture uh, discussion format. So those folks then typically took the best, what they thought were the most useful stages from all year. And that is what they did in the NTI. Um, and then the, just the raw numbers, um, I'm, I have the team pictures from 2008 and 2009, the, the two years that I was, was on the team. And uh, there were, between the people there and those noted as not pictured, uh, there were 41 team members in 2008 and 43 in 2009 that were involved in putting that thing together. And at least darn near half of those donated two or three days prior to the NTI building everything. Um, and then the NTI ran, was it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? No, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday um, was different years, was, was for different things. Sometimes Sunday was... Uh, team events, as in you and a partner, partner got to go through stages and, and that sort of thing. So these people basically donated a week of their life to this and 
there was the monthly uh, meetings and sessions that led to them deciding what to do. And we're talking nearly 50 people, you know, at least 40 people. Uh, it's a massive undertaking, uh, not to mention the finances of actually the target systems and the walls for the shoot houses and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, as you said, the venue, when we say range, we're talking about a gun club that actually had, what was it, nine bays, 10 bays? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah nine or 10 bays that they, they mm -hmm. ran all of them. So um, not saying it's impossible. It, it certainly would be, but it would either be very, very expensive uh, or, again, it would, would involve the right place with the right people. Uh, to volunteer all of that. Yeah, for those of you who are familiar with setting up for TACCON, this would be a magnitude more than than what TACCON would be. So I orders yeah. a magnitude more than TACCON. Yeah. So um just I mean just putting the village together is, you know, I'm thinking, wow, God bless you guys, because you know, that's that's a lot of work. So um, I do have a question, though, that uh, my buddy Jeff Bishop from uh, the Jefferson Town PD sent, and that was uh, to get to ask you guys, uh, what do you think best prepared you for the event before you went? So anybody want to take that one? I was really prepared the first time I went. All I had to do was shoot. My best preparation for the event was previous events and then training in things other. I'd say uh, several things worked. I mean, the, the shooting stuff was especially because when I was going through there, I was in my early 30s. I was probably, for lack of better words, I hate to say my shooting prime, but like I think I'd won the TACCON match about that time. So the shooting part was really easy. It was everything else that was the struggle. And uh, he's it's a name that's largely forgotten, but for a long time, there was a guy within it in the Atlanta area by the name of David Blinder, and he had been to the NTI and he actually ran his own like a day long class called the test, which was almost like a miniature NTI. And I made a lot of mistakes there. Uh, and I think that was one of the most important things was um, just getting over the the environment and being able to adapt to how do I say um, recognizing that it's artificial. And knowing which parts of the artificiality are significant and which ones aren't. Uh, it was kind of cool. Another thing I'll say there is that I, I, I only found out years later that I actually shot Claude Werner because Claude was a regular role player there. And apparently that was one of the few people that has actually successfully shot Claude along that way. But I think having been in an environment similar to the NTI beforehand was hugely useful. And the other thing was just you had to have the shooting skills squared away. That was almost a given if you're going to do well at the NTI. But it was the everything else that was a challenge. And like I said, some of the stuff, I just don't know where it came from. Um, you know, verbal agility. Um, I just pulled that one out of my butt that day. Quit failing to right things pull out. Yeah. Yeah, I would say um, for people outside of, of law enforcement who, you know, Folks in law enforcement have uh, typically an academy of going through mock scenes, have gone through various training in interacting with people. Uh, and then obviously on the job, uh, have a lot of practice interacting with people, looking for the opportunity for training, interacting with people and interacting with the environment. Unfortunately, it is very, very difficult to find those classes and some of the classes that are out there uh, that are billed as that really are not done very well and uh, are, are not giving you very good material. And that's, that's difficult. Um, Craig Douglas's programs would be, would be fantastic. Anybody that he's talking about um, that is doing that sort of thing. I used to do it. I'm not doing it currently anymore. Uh, Insights Training Center does a street vehicle tactics class, I think one a year in the Seattle area. You'd have to travel to Seattle, Washington. I can tell you that David Blinder's class was based on a, uh, a class that uh, Greg Hamilton and I used to do that people called the NTI prep. Um, and in fact, it was 
uh, us doing a three-day street and vehicle tactics class that we used to do in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. Typically, the reason I got called that is we did it the week before because we could roll that into paying for our trip to the East Coast to attend the NTI. Um, but uh, but it was a, a three-day street and vehicle tactics class. And that um, nowadays, and I say this from being somebody involved with Global War on Terror uh, and uh, as a security contractor as well, uh, a lot of what people are teaching for vehicle tactics are totally irrelevant to the civilian context and are not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about learning how to to run your AR uh, in a counter ambush role. I'm talking about actually interacting with people in situations that are similar or that are based on things that might happen to you in real life. And uh, I wish I had more concrete examples to tell you. Uh, Randy or somebody else may know of some other folks that are doing good training in this area. But you got to get out of the idea that spending this, the bulk of your training time on shaving fractions of a second off of your physical performance is the end all be all. You've got to be willing to put your ego out there and go do some stuff that makes you uncomfortable and is on the software side where, yes, you may not agree with the opinion of whoever's grading it or evaluating it. The purpose is not to be comparing yourself to other people. The purpose is to be improving your individual skills. If I could uh, quote one of my favorite sources, the inestimable John Holshan. I think the direct quote was, there is no end to the benefit of technical skill, but technical skill is not the end of preparation. And I think that's a great way to summarize all this up. Uh, what do you, if you, uh, we'll go around real quick. What do you think your biggest takeaways from your NTI experiences were? Uh, we'll start with Randy, do Tim, then John. Well, biggest takeaway, um, the shooting problem is going to be in most cases, not the most difficult part of the problem. Um, it, you know, the Sonny Pazikas used to say that 99% uh, of the people spend 100% of their time working on the last 5% of the solution, and that's entirely true. Um, again, if you wanted to get in a gun, into a gunfight, you could. If you wanted to avoid it, depending on your ability to verbalize and read cues, you could probably do that. Um, the um, biggest takeaway or my biggest advice would be train broad and wide. Don't, unless you're, you know, a competitive shooter and planning on being a competitive shooter, um, cutting time off your split times is not where it's at. Um, shooting a sub two second bill drill is not. Let's lose Randy. Did he freeze? You lost somebody. Tim, what do you think your biggest takeaways are from the NTI? Probably the biggest takeaway from the NTI was how important it was to recognize what was going on. For uh, things. Before, yeah, before things get, you know, before you get so deep in the hole that you can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you if you could see what was going on, Especially in the interactive portion, if you could figure out what was going on early, then you had lots of options. And if you didn't recognize it until it was late, then your options narrowed down and they tended to be more difficult. The um, was in part true in the live fire, too. I mean, they set up the live fire exercises so that when you went through it, there were things that you should exercise. Harder. Um, in the active portion. John, what were your thoughts, sir? Yeah, kind of my uh, my previous statement summarizes a lot of it, but uh, I guess to to summarize it a different way, uh, it's about fighting, and uh, fighting is a it's a strategic balance of, of of everything you've got to manage the environment and everything in it that's the people that's the structures around you 
um, and that, and you've got to do it with all the tools at your uh, disposal. And the firearm is one of them. But uh, you know, it's Steinbeck uh, that says, uh, you know, the ultimate weapon is the brain; all else is supplemental. And uh, and that is absolutely the the fact is uh, get away from pure gun skills and look for those opportunities to train all the rest of it. Uh, I'll just uh, throw this out here real quick. You know, I was going through some notes and stuff like that. I, you know, I think that one of the takeaways I had was just, dude, get your skills squared away so you can worry about other things, right? But uh, my other kind of cheesy thought was I was, the other thing that made the logistics of the NTI so great was we all stayed at the hotel and there was a fairly decent English pub in that hotel. I was thinking my big, probably my biggest Elephant takeaways Castle. from the NTI. Yeah, my, my biggest takeaways were that there were some awesome people that attended the NTI and I'm still friends with a lot of them and they've had big impacts on me. So, you know, the NTI didn't just, you know, help me validate and test a bunch of skills. I, I've, I've got friends that I'm still talking to to these days from it. So I, you know, I, I'm deeply appreciative of that experience. So uh, as, we, as we try to wrap this thing up, uh, any shameless plugging or shilling of businesses we would like to engage in at this point? John needs more shillings. I've, I've taken John's class. It's awesome. John needs to be teaching this class everywhere. Tim's, Tim's shaking his head because he was there as well. So, John, and it is awesome. shilling for us, please. <laughs> uh, WestCoastArmoryNorth.com. you got to get the north in there. WestCoastArmoryNorth.com. I'm a little slow getting uh, my calendar out for next year. Uh, I know I'm going to be in Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Florida, and maybe Texas. Uh, frankly, if there's anybody out there that's interested in hosting a class, if you've got uh, some folks that you think are interested in a place, uh, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at Tom Boy Sam Hotel, TBSH, at westcoastarmorynorth.com. Drop me an email. Ask me any questions. Always happy to respond as well. And uh, yeah, I'll probably do a half dozen or so classes uh, on the road next year. Not a whole bunch of them. Wonder what do you have going on? Um, I would just like a second uh, recommending uh, Big John. We'll call Big John Little John. Big John uh, Holshin's class. Um, I, the reason that I was not in it this year is because the wife and I were out of town for our anniversary, and I would have gotten murdered if I had uh, gone to his class. So to preserve domestic tranquility, I'll have to pass that until next year. Um, as far as what I've got going on, um, I've kind of like john i have uh not exactly gotten next year all filled in on the calendar yet uh because i've been focusing a large portion of my time this year uh getting ready for the idpa world championship which is now over with and i can now get focused back on uh doing more training so uh what i've got left on the schedule for this year i've got a couple of what we call the tennessee georgia alabama training group uh, meetings. Those are basically like one day long uh, coaching sessions. The two that we have coming up uh, are the uh, Christmas extravaganzas. I've got one in uh, Dayton, Tennessee coming up the 25th of November and then the uh, in Oliver Springs at the Windrock uh, Shooting and Training Center. Uh, that is December 9th and those are they're all competitive drills uh that we shoot and we give out a certificate for the winner of each drill and then i during the year i collect um shooting and self-defense oriented books and dvds and i give those out as door prizes so you know come on out and shoot with us and you'll get something you know free to take home with you um as far as uh classes for next year uh we'll be doing red dot class or two we'll be doing a vehicle class um probably be doing a uh, interactive force on force class uh, maybe a couple of those um so just uh, see where where the where the road takes us next year you have a website randy do you have a Facebook oh yeah presence? that might that might be helpful too uh, i'm horrible at marketing uh it's harriscombative.com it's a uh, harris combative strategies is the name but harriscombative.com is the uh, website and if you want to shoot an email to me, it's randy at harriscombative.com. Uh, real quickly, uh, my website is twopillarstraining.com. 
I have my annual review of crime stats and look at criminals. That's uh, going to be an online class on December 28th of this year. Uh, I'm still working on my 24 schedule as well. I'm for sure going to be lecturing at Carl Wren's class and uh, location in January. The shooting class is already filled up there. I'm trying to get some dates finalized elsewhere, but I'll probably Ohio in May. Uh, I'm working on Amarillo sometime this spring as well. I'll be back in Culpeper, Virginia in October. Uh, and again, if you go to twopillarstraining.com, uh, you can uh, find those dates and uh, as they become available. Uh, Tim, anything to plug, shamelessly self-promote, you know? No, I don't sell training. I buy it. I got some training Excellent. I can sell you. <laughs> I, can hook I, want to thank all, I want to thank all the guests for showing up and uh, sharing their experiences with us. And for those of you listening to this, um, we apologize for the lack of weans, but we do appreciate your time and do appreciate you spending it with us. And I think you're supposed to only share this podcast with your smart friends. So please do so. Thank you for your time this evening.